prayer. Father, we thank you this day. Thank you, Father, that we're here this day, Father. Thank you, Lord God, that we are sitting in your house. Father, we thank you for your house. Your house is beautiful, Lord God, your dwelling place. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for the church, for you have committed yourself to your church. You made a covenant with your church, Lord. And we are, Father, we are blessed to be part of that covenant, Lord, this day, Father. Lord, that we have been united with Jesus. And because, Lord God, we've been united with Jesus, we've been united with you. Father, anything that we think we are, Lord God, Father, is nothing. Everything that we are is in Christ. He is everything. And because he is everything, Lord God, Father, we have that relationship with you. Our righteousness are like filthy rags. But our righteousness is not in our own righteousness. It's all in Christ. Hallelujah. And we thank you for that because of his righteousness has been imputed to us. Because of his death, we have life this day and life to the full. We thank you, Lord, you came to give us life. We thank you, Lord, you came to give us breath. The breath of your spirit, Lord God, was breathed upon us and we became born again. Father, once we were dead, now we are alive in your glorious son. And we thank you, Lord, because your son lives, we also live. Lord, there is no more death for those who are in Christ Jesus, Lord. And we thank you, Father. That goes beyond our complex to think. But, Lord God, we take it in faith. Lord God, Father, I just pray your blessing now, Father, as I begin to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Again, some of you are just coming in a little bit later. Thank you all for taking the time and the trouble to come here. And, um, and I'm just blessed when I see so many people. Maybe there could have been more. I don't know many people are ministers, but I want to say to all of us here, all of us are ministers before the Lord. A lot of people who think they're ministers are probably in for a wake-up call when they stand before the living God. I want to tell you that right now. Just because you have a title means nothing. As God looks at the heart, it doesn't look at a title. It doesn't look at your initials. Many people with great amount of initials after their names I'm sorry, the only initial I've got is pastor because I didn't get all those qualifications and get all the MDs, Bs, whatever. Like Malcolm shared, it's one of those books isn't it, Fair Sunshine and um, Jock Purvis. Uh, I was never very nationalistic. I was just a bit of an idiot, to be truthful, you know, just lived in that kind of cloud world of hash and all the rest of it. And I wasn't saying I had anything great within me that really was felt I was really Scots. But I suppose it's just inherently within us because that has been placed with what we're Scots, amen. And I've always had that deep within me. I was always like, Any, anybody ask me who you are, I'm Scottish. I would never say British, but I'm part of Britain and I accept that. But that book, Jock Purvis, I remember I did a tour of Africa with Ben Petu and um, we were in Zimbabwe, we were in Tanzania. And I remember one of these times, the only other book I took outside my Bible was somebody gave me a copy of Jock Purvis's Fair Sunshine. And I can't remember, I think it was in Zimbabwe or was it in Tanzania, but I'm out in the sticks and, um, and a wee tent, mosquitoes biting me because my zip didn't work and obviously I'm the, I was the poor one out of the three of us. They had good tents and I had this little tent and the zip didn't come down. And I remember one night I brought out the book Fair Sunshine and I read it and I read it and I was, my, I was broken and my spirit was crying out to God for this nation. I'm in Africa crying out to God for Scotland. Ben Patu must have thought he was trying to show a bit of David Livingston within us and maybe we would have the call to Africa. I'm in Africa and I'm crying my eyes out in darkest Africa, crying and crying. This book just cut me to the heart and it opened up my eyes to my history, to my past and to the men and the women that lived all those years ago. That we seem to have lost sight of them because, you know, sometimes in the past, you know, we can forget the past. And as I've got even down here, I'm going to be reading a lot of notes, so please forgive me. I'll probably try and break in and out of that. But you know, we, people say history is a great teacher. And how true that statement is, isn't it? For if we get our roots, which is our identity, we're at the mercy of those who want to make us or reshape us into who they want us to be. And that's always been the plans and the purpose of Satan. He's always tried to reshape us and to destroy our heritage and our identity and our identity we know is in God. You know, it's the roots that support the tree. My little grandson, Oren, and went up the braes last Sunday, the braes being the hills, for you who might know what braes are. I and mean, we're looking at a lot of trees and they're all turned over and I says, Oren, look at the roots. That tree stands because of the roots. Without those roots, that tree would be vulnerable and the first one that's going to crash down. We don't realize how important our roots are individually and collectively of the nation. And the devil would like to try and get us to forget our roots. But thank God, the roots of this nation are deep within me because God has quickened them to us. Hallelujah. And he's quickened them to you as well. Passionate. I'm passionate for Scotland. Passionate for Scotland. 
And I would like to say, like John Knox, give me Scotland, at least I die. But I'm not really in that place to be able to say that. Yes, the words could come out of my mouth, but they would really come from my heart. I believe God is doing heart surgery. God is bringing us back to that place, bringing our people back to that place, that we again, as Scotsmen and women, that we will find our roots and find our heritage and we will rise up and be this generation for today. But we've got a devil who would seek to try and rob us of who we are. Our identity is in God first and foremost. Hallelujah, glory to God. But this nation, I believe this nation's got a special place in the heart of the living God and God wants to bring us back to that place again to, again, to realize who we are as a Scottish people. You know, Hitler, in the vision of his new future, his new future, the Third Reich, or the Third Empire, that would last a thousand years. You know, the devil doesn't, you know, keep his secrets from us. He tells us exactly what he wants to do. Here it was, it's the, the millennium rule of the Third Reich, or the Third Empire. Really, what's the great empire of the Son of the Lord, Jesus Christ, when he ruled this world for a thousand years, the millennium which is coming before us. But he set out to destroy the cultural landscape of Europe. Not only to destroy many, many people, but he set out to destroy the cultural landscape of Europe. I remember an incident that took place in the Opera Square in Berlin, 1933. It says, crowds watched. Thousands of books considered to be un-German were burned openly. A big, massive bonfire, and people came in and were burning all the literature, burning everything, destroying that kind of history as he thought was un-German or anything that was going to be opposed to where he was wanting to direct the people, especially books in Judaism, Freemasonry, Marxism. They want, someone once says, once you start burning books, you will end up burning people. It's a saying. And that found its greatest fulfillment, didn't it, in the ovens of the Holocaust camps when all these people were actually burnt alive, put into these places. We see that in Catholicism as well. Many people, they burnt them at the stake. And that's when you start burning books. We see all of these things. He wanted to eliminate all opposition, everything. No more elections. He was now the one who was going to be in authority. And we see that with many other despot rulers. Mao Zedong of China. Maoism was another sadistic monster who was responsible for killing, some say, as much as 50 million people through his communistic policies. An agricultural policy that left millions to starve. Plus, he ended up killing anybody who had any education, teachers, professors, anybody that he felt they might have threatened with him. He put them to death and destroyed that nation of China. But yet, sometimes they still hold him up as a hero within the communist regimes. We see all of these things taking place. But listen, we could look even further back to the other conquering empires like Greece and the Hellenization of the worldview that they had, that they wanted to spread the Greek culture around the world and they did a great job arts language philosophies which still have a massive impact to us today that was the legacy of Alexander the Great and those who came after him they were determined to flood the world with their Hellenized Asian culture we can look further back even than that well, later on we'll go we'll go, go back we'll go forward the Roman Empire followed coming to rule say about 40 BC and it probably lasted about 500 years and then it came to an end. That was the western leg. But the eastern leg went on for another thousand years. And to that, to it came to an end as well. After that period of time, we come into the Dark Ages, or some will say the Middle Ages, dominated, I suppose, by Roman Catholicism, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, which was full of wickedness. The harlot that, that was, it was a harlot church who kept people in darkness, deliberately kept people in darkness, Kept the word of God from them. Kept them, kept them ignorant. Kept them downtrodden. Catholicism has got a lot to answer for. In fact, we could quote from, it was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs quoted in the harlot in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. And Catholicism got a lot to answer for. Let us, it may, look, a leper can never change its spots. Be careful with Catholicism, brothers and sisters. Be careful. And be careful with communism as well, I might add as well. It's why to put a new face on. But I want to tell you this, we have to look at the roots of where they are and where they're coming from. Then we could go to the Renaissance age, French word meaning rebirth. That came off the back of the dark, age, the dark ages. And all of a sudden now we see there was this wonderful revival of classical learning, wisdom, man's abilities and Poetry, art, phenomenal, sculptures, 
everything exploded, and that's why they call it that wonderful kind of revival place and period of time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But in amongst all of that, it began to flourish, and we see these things taking place because basically it says that rather than basically places where man rather than God was at the center of his own universe, that's what humanism was developed alongside that. That rather than God being the center of the universe, man was the center of his own universe, caught up in his own importance. That was that age that we see there. 1503 though, the Catholic Church, because of a man called Martin Luther was raised up. Thank God for the Martin Luther and the legacy that he came. He rose up in the midst of all of that and began to challenge the status quo, which was dominated by the Catholic Church. And we can see that there with the Martin Luther coming to that place of enlightenment. Roman Catholicism no longer could keep the people in darkness and ignorance for the light began to shine. Thank God. Thank God for light. When it shines, it dispels the darkness. And here came a great glorious light in amongst that move as well. The age of enlightenment, or they call it the age of reason, was to follow. A European intellectual movement in the 17th and the 18th centuries in which ideas concerning God Reason, nature, and humanity were synchronized into a worldview that gained wide ascent in the West and instigated revolutionary developments in art and philosophy and politics and all of these things. Central to the Enlightenment thought was the use that celebrated that of reason, the power of humans to understand the universe and improve their own condition. Hallelujah. We see that often. Listen, thank God that God has made us who we are. God has given us a mind that we, 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 not, we want to understand because it comes from God. We want to explore. Now they want to fly rockets all over the outer space. If you can believe the rockets are landing in Mars and dropping vehicles to drive around, then I want to tell you this, then you've got a lot more faith than I have. Whether that has happened, whether it's not happened, who knows? But they tell us all of these things. But man in, in himself is always it's such an inquisitive, inquisitive because God's made us to be inquisitive because we were created in the image of God. And God has made that for us to be able to explore, to be able to test things, to be able to strive to knowledge and to know more. For it comes from the Lord when it's rooted in the Lord. Unfortunately, when you lose sight of God, you get rooted in yourself. And this is where all our problems have come from. The goals of rational humanity was considered to be knowledge, freedom, and happiness. Freedom. Probably freedom to do our own thing. We could probably look back to the Garden of Eden. You know, when the man ate of the tree and he should not have ate of it. You know, and it says, and because a tempter came, didn't he? And says, if you eat of that tree, he says, because God knows, you know, that once you eat of that tree and the knowledge, you will be like God himself, knowing good and evil. And that was the bait, wasn't it? You will be like God. And that is the biggest problem that we face today. Everybody, everybody wants to be their own entity. I want to be my own man. I want to be my own woman. There's that sense within us and many other people. We lose sight of God and we want to be. I want to be my own boss. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I want to choose my way. And we know that there's been many songs sung about that. Hallelujah. Other times we say we're happy to know God. Many people are saying, I'm happy to know God. I speak to people all the time, uh, as Malcolm does, I'm sure. And everybody says, yes, I believe in God. But just give me 10 minutes with you, my friend, over a cup of tea, and I will tell you whether you believe in God, because everybody likes the thought of God or the God of their own understanding. And we know that that comes true there as well, isn't it? The God of our own understanding. And um, because people create an image of God that makes them feel happy and comfortable in that revelation. But we need to get the real revelation of this living God. There's a psalm I love and it's one, that's my, it's one of the psalms I constantly go back to and it's Psalm 131 and it says this, My heart is not proud, O Lord, and my eyes are not haughty, for I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. We need to get to the very basis of everything of life itself, it is God. And we need to put God in his proper place. And when you put God in his proper place, then life will be wonderful indeed because God has to be the center of my universe and your universe. And we're talking about us as individually and collectively. We have to see who God is. Trouble is with man, man put God on a slab and I preached this once a long, long time ago. We put God in an operating table in a lab and we've tried to perform an autopsy and to examine and evaluate who God, who God is. 
We've tried to understand God. Do you know that we'll never, ever, 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 ever understand God? Do you know that he's so beyond us that we can never even contemplate who this great God is? And I thank God that I sometimes walk now with my little grandson, little Oren, and he just takes him by the hand. And he's just so totally confident in walking with me that I'm going to protect him and take care of him. And I could probably tell him anything and he'd probably believe it because he's still five in that age of vulnerability. But that's how God wants us to walk with him, that we just take him by, he takes us by the hand and we allow God, we walk with God. I don't have to understand things that's beyond my understanding. And that was the biggest problem, not just in the world, but even with the church, because now we're trying to understand God and we're, and we're going to places we should never be. He is God. End of story. That's why it says in the beginning, it says, I am. That's it. I am. And when you know him as the I am, then you can just simply by faith and trust your life to him. And I can walk faithfully before God. I don't worry about tomorrow. I just, I just, I just trust. My trust is in the Lord. Hallelujah. And in his word. Glory to God. Because he's a loving father. And he knows all things. And he'll keep me and he'll protect me forever and ever and ever. But this is what we see. And we can read also, it says, the foolish man built his house upon the sand, but the wise man built his house upon the rock. And that rock is Christ Jesus, the eternal rock. And you need to work out where you're building your house this day. Is it on sand or is it on the rock? Which is based upon this word of the living God that we have before us, that God has given to us. I say this, thank God for childlike faith. Amen. I don't try and kid myself on that I'm, 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 I'm anything because I am nothing but in him, I have my being. Hallelujah. Childlike faith is precious. Let us be children before the living God. Did the day not come when the apostles were arguing amongst themselves who was wanting to be the greatest? And that's what we deal with today, even in church. Everybody wants to be up there somewhere. And Jesus pulls a child in and says, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like this child, you're in danger of not even getting into the kingdom of God. Meaning humble yourself. Humble yourself before the living God and let God pick you up. Now, we could look at many things and we could say, now, what, what kind of age do we find ourselves even within today? I've got down here as well, it says, now the new age movement. I've been through a lot of different movements here. I've been through the enlightenment movement and there was a reason for that and to examine all of these things. But now the new age movement with its counterculture message still seems to be dominating the field. It has tentacles far more powerful and influential than many people care to think. This is the age that we're living in now. I've taken us through ages because we can all understand the ages and the things that have come. But do we understand the times that we find ourselves in? We have this now, this new age movement with its counterculture message that said dominating the field. It dominates all life. We can look at where it begins. Many people get different places and where it started, where it did not start. Helena Balinski, if I'm pronouncing that properly, from the Theosophical Society, which was an occult group. And she was very much in tune with the spiritual realm. Then we have Alice Bailey, and many of you have heard of Alice Bailey. She was considered to be the prophetess of that New Age movement. She was getting all of her information from a Tibetan master, Dijal Ku, if I'm pronouncing that properly as well. And she got a lot of her information. She wrote a lot of books. And these books had such an influence upon this nation and this world that we find ourselves in. There was a 10-point plan to destroy or to weaken our Judean Christian heritage that she was promoting. I'm just going to again read that to you in case you're not familiar with it. It should come up here on this phone. I better come up here on this phone, but there we go. And this was a 10-point plan of this woman Alice Bailey promoted. She died around 1949. I don't know when she produced this, but I'll just read it out to you. The Bible is one, she says, take God in prayer out of the education system. Now, this was probably written in the late 1940s. Listen to what she is promoting here. Take God in prayer out of the education system. And I think today we realize that God has been removed from many schools. Reduce parental authority over your children. I see we all can probably say amen to that as well. We're not allowed to smack our children now and we're scared to say anything to our children just now in case they start shouting to authorities. Destroy Judean Christian family, destructure or the traditional Christian family structure. 
That was all part and part of the plan. If sex is free, then make abortion legal and make it easy. Remember, this was written in the late 1940s or thereabouts. We're starting to see all of that now has been fulfillment. Make divorce easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Everything has challenged the very laws and principles of God. Hence the reason there's 10 of them. Number six, make homosexuality an alternative lifestyle in all of its varieties. And there's so much perversity now and it's hard to keep track in the degrees in which we're going now. Debase art, make it run mad. Crazy paintings. Art is very powerful, friends. Very powerful. And more than you would care to think. Use media to promote and to change mindsets. And the devil's box that we all have, TVs or other areas that we can watch stuff on, is riddled now with pornography, with filth, with nakedness, with sex, violence, and all kinds of corruptness, all kinds of the fallen nature. It's all promoted through there. Be careful of TVs, because your gate, eye gate and ear gate is absorbing all of it. You might think it doesn't affect you. I want to tell you this. Whatever you eat will have an impact upon your body. If you drink poison, I want you to tell you this. It's going to affect your body, and you'll be lucky to be alive. TVs are full of poison. Now, there's good things on it. I'm not decrying that. But I want to tell you this. There's a lot of stuff in there that's going to penetrate you. And the devil knows that. Nine, create an interfaith movement. So just make Christianity not the main religion. There's many religions, many things you can, people can worship. And we need to flood that. We see our nation just now being flooded with many other religions. Islam is making a big move to take this nation. And they are committed to take this nation. And we'd be foolhardy to try not to understand that. Why they've been flooding into our nation? Then you better ask the government because they're the ones that's allowing it to come. Do you think they can't stop these boats coming across the channel? Do you think they can't do a lot more to stop these thousands and hundreds of thousands of people invading our nation? Because they're trying to dilute who we are as a people will flood the nation with all of these things. And number 10, get the government to make all these into law and then get the church to endorse the changes. And to our shame, brothers and sisters, when we see the state of the church today, that is exactly what's taking place. So the government's taking it, the government's rolling it out, and the churches now are being forced to accept it. Well, not all the churches, but we know a lot of churches have now gone down that road and accepting all of these things. And honestly, you would wonder why it's all taking place. Now you wonder, I've said all of this to say this, Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, what has been will be again and what has been done will be done again for there's nothing new under the sun. I think we think we're living in a unique age but listen, I want to tell you this, is Solomon in his wisdom if you believe Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and, um, but it's true. We can have different ages, different empires, different kings, different rulers but let us remember they are all earthly puppets of their spiritual masters. Amen. Demons, dark forces, fallen angels in the heavenly realms. They're the ones who's running the show. They're the ones that's controlling things. We, we can identify ages and people and the rulers, but really they are influenced by what's taking place in the heavenlies. Hence the reason, and I'll read it straight from the book so you know it's coming from the word. We know these scriptures in Ephesians 6, and it says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to take your, take your stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You now God has told us to stand, not to fall down. Hallelujah. That we stand before the Lord. The real battle is in the heavenlies. And the early church knew that battle. They were much more open to spiritual things than we seem to have been today. There seems to be a dark cloud come over us. We seem to have lost sight of the spiritual realm. And we've got caught up in the natural, the here and the now. And that's why the devil is running and running riot across not only our nation, but the nations. So we are told to war, to war in the heavenlies with prayer and intercession. That's why there's a prayer meeting here every day or Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning, and Friday night, half past 6 to 8 o'clock, because we realize the importance of prayer. When we do battle in that realm, and we cry out to the living God, for prayer is powerful, glory to God for the pulling down, for wrestling with these dark powers that have governed our land for far too long, that have come over our nation. We need to do battle in the heavenlies. 
But we fight in two realms, brothers and sisters. There's the spiritual realm as the earthly planes that we also have to stand up against wickedness and unrighteousness. We fight these two realms. Second Corinthians 2 and 11, Paul says this, least Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. Glory to God. They were very much, Paul was so much aware of that spiritual realm. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes that he could take advantage of us. How dull, how blind we have become to the realm, the spirit of the age, satanic powers that we sometimes we end up fighting and falling over each other. I love this little verse and you'll get this in 2 Kings and we'll go to it and it's, it's a prayer that I often offer up in the morning and my prayer, a special prayer that I've offered up and it wasn't really based upon this but maybe it was influenced by it subconsciously, isn't it? When you read the word of God that can have that impact upon you. But when I stand before the Lord in my hill, my special place, I often say this, Lord, open up my eyes to see that which is unseen and open up my ears to hear the still voice the still small voice of your spirit. Like never before, my friend, we need our eyes to be opened afresh and we need our ears to be opened to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. We need to shut down the voices that just clamor and scream and we need to just spend time with the living God and say, Father, speak, your servant listens. I mean, that advice was given to the young man Samuel, wasn't it? When he, kinda, you know, when he, he, wasn't, he hadn't learned to hear the voice of God. And Eli shouts him down, you know, and then, you know, Eli being the high priest, but of course he wasn't in the place where he should have been. Eventually, the third time, the young boy Samuel runs to him and says, you called, you called. And then the penny drops with Eli and says, my son, go back down. And when you hear the voice speaking to you again, say, speak, I'm listening. You know, that's a word today, it wasn't in my notes, by the way, it just came there. I'd say that's a word for all of us, maybe some of you in particular. We need to get into the quiet place, isn't it? And Jesus says, go into your, whenever you're going to pray, go into your rooms and shut the door. And your father who is in secret will hear your heart and God will speak to you. So there's places we have to go to. If you want to hear from God, you better get into your quiet place, wherever that might be, and spend time with God and just say, Lord, I'll, I'll speak to me. I'm opening up my ears. Spend time reading and just open up your heart. Spend time in prayer and then shut up. <laughs> I have to keep telling myself that because sometimes in prayers we run away, don't we? We have to give God time to speak back and say, look, Arthur, look, give me a moment to speak. Do you find it hard to be still? Be still in the presence of the Lord. We need to be a people that's going to be still today. And I pray today that you're going to be a stillness here that we can hear the voice of the Lord speaking to us. And that still small voice, it just drops into your heart and your mind. And you just know, I've just heard from the Lord. Glory to God. And I could bring out a lot of gems, but we won't because I want to push through with this but let me read this and it's here is Elijah now we know the king of Assyria was making war against Israel and then in the camp and, and, he, and he's making plans and I'll, I'll probably just run through it. and he says we're going to do this we're going to do that and then it says the king of Israel sent someone to the place which the man of God had told him and then he you know every time he plans something Israel's one step ahead of the game and says therefore the heart of the king of Assyria says he's troubled he says listen who's speaking to the king of Israel Who's the spy? Who's, who's, who is informing, you know, the, the king of Israel of my plans? And I love this. It says this in 12. And one of his servants says, None, my lord, the king, but Elisha, or Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king the words that, that you speak in your bedroom. I love that. <laughs> the very words you speak in your bedroom, he, know, he knows. He, 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 you know, and, and, and he's mad. And he, and he sends an army. He goes, go and get this man. We need to deal with him. I need to shut that man off. I need, to, I need to kill that man. That man's a dangerous man. Can I tell you this? As a church, if we really start functioning as we should be functioning, the devil will be scared of the church again. Hallelujah. And he's not. He's a, we're a laughing stock. And I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm talking about the whole, not as individually, so don't, don't take it personal. But we're a laughing stock from where we should be. We should be hearing the voice of God and one step ahead of the enemy. We should be hearing that. And Elijah was a wanted man. And of course, all the chariots and the horses turn up and they surround, you know, Dothan where he is. And of course, the servant freaks out. Alas, my master, what shall we do? You know, it's, it's good that we get the, you know, the fear. And he looks around and there's the enemy all around them. And it's like, there's no way out, we're trapped. And I love the reply of Elijah. He says this, do not fear for those who are with us are more than with those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened his eyes to the young man and he saw. 
And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. His eyes was open to the realm of the spirit. Guys, we live in a spiritual realm and we live in a physical world. And I want to tell you this. Elisha says there are far more for us than are against us. And we have to realize sometimes we can feel as if, you know, we're crowded with the enemy. He seems to have the high ground. I want to tell you this. The Lord of Lords is the one who stands with us. Glory to God. Amen. And we are surrounded with the heavenly hosts. And if we knew, knew that, I want to tell you this, it will make us bold and it will make us courageous. You know, there's that wonderful verse, isn't it? It says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Hallelujah. You read that in Isaiah 59. King James will certainly make that clear. God will always raise up a standard, friends. Yes, enemy can, the, the enemy can have the upper hand and, and God can turn us over to the enemy. We read it all through scriptures. We see it in the, in the history of Israel. And I'll tell you this, if you, you'll see it in the history of Scotland also. When we turn our backs upon God, God will pull back from us and he will turn us over to the enemy and we'll see God's judgments many times again. And Israel will see that against many other nations. It's just as theism and deism. Some people think theism, which means basically God wound up the clock and then just steps outside of time and everything is happening by chance. It's all in the natural workings that God has set the clock in motion. But theism says no. It says God is right in the midst of time. So yes, God stands outside of time, but God is in the right in the midst of time. God is very present, working now. Amen. He's here. He's now. He's with us. Glory to God. That's what gives me my strength, knowing if God is for you, who can be against you? Glory to God. So we see, and we now will turn to our wonderful nation of Scotland. And it is wonderful. I love it. I love the land. I love my land. I love the sun. So I don't know what I'm living in the land for. <laughs> but I love my nation. I wouldn't be anywhere else. Because God has placed Scotland within my heart. Glory to God. He, he, he's deposited it within me. And I've got such a desire for this nation. To see this nation again be the nation that God has called us to be. Hallelujah. And I might say something further as we go on down here. Scotland's first reformation, brethren, was completed in 1560. Yes, Martin Luther was a catalyst and a bright light that shone in Europe. And yes, we've heard that our fathers had been influenced by him and had been exposed to him. In 1560, the stroke of a pen, Scotland was now a Protestant country. Glory to God. After centuries of being subjected to the Pope and Catholicism, Scotland was free, 1560. It became a Protestant nation, near enough overnight, the stroke of a pen. Because God Holmes did everything possible to keep hold of our land. It was a hard fought battle, but God had prepared its champions. Amen. Do you know, God is always going to raise up deliverers and God is always going to raise up champions. That gives us hope for today. Who knows, there could be champions here in our midst, we don't even know it. But God can do a deep work. For whosoever, whosoever will open themselves up to God, I want to tell you this, God is the God of the whosoever. It doesn't mean you have to be a pastor, you don't have to be anything. You just have to be a man or a woman that says, like, Father, here I am, use me. And I like to say that in the morning. Here I am, Lord, you get any business with me? Then see, I say, here I am. I'm here. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. You know, you've got to give God permission. It doesn't come automatically, friends. You need to surrender your will for his will to be done in you. Trouble is, we say, God, I want you to do your will, and then you run about doing your own will. I think it was D.L. Moody and the great evangelist of uh, yesterday, and he was sitting, and I forget the man he sat and talked to, and this man says, you know, God is, the world's yet to see what God can do for a man who is fully committed to him. And D.L. Moody said in his heart, he says, I'm going to be that man. Just an ordinary man. We don't know the work that he did behind the scenes. You know, something you can see the top of a, a tree, but see the root structure that supports it. That's the hidden work that God does in this man. And the rest is history for the man D.L. Moody. But I want to tell you this, God is no respect to the people. There is hope for each and every single one of us. You just have to come to the place where you say, God, I want you in my life. Glory to God. I want you at the very center of my life. And as we go, we can see then, God prepares his champions. I'm going to bring out one champion to begin with that maybe that, maybe that might just catch your imagination. And that one champion is William Wallace. 
you know, we call him the, 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 great, the great William Wallace, the man who was passionate for our land and for our nation. I believe Wallace was a godly man, and it depends what kind of history side you want to look at it. He was trained. He was a very educated man, spoke many languages. But I want to tell you this, I believe God, that William Wallace was a godly man, a godly man who stood up and was prepared to fight for what was right. I mean, oh, he stood against the, the, the king of England, hallelujah, who tried to usurp our nation, and he took a stand, and he was a, he was a spark, hallelujah, that God chose to, to use. He fought for the freedom of our, na- our nation against tyranny and tyrants. And I want to tell you this, see, today, we've, we've been ruled by tyranny, and we've been ruled by tyrants today, tyrants today. You dress them up any way you want, I want to tell you, they're tyrants running our nation just now. Just look at the laws that they are forcing upon us. Just look at the filth that is getting rolling out of our nation. Who's making these? Our government, and I'll put it on tape, is wicked and it's evil. And it's totally out to destroy our Judean Christian heritage. And I want to tell you this, it goes back to Alice Bailey's 10-point plan. There's many nations, especially the West, they are based that. United Nations adopted that. You might not read that, but I'm telling you this, they have adopted that. And across the Western nations, they are using that now. And our government is actually working on that as well. To our shame. To our shame. And we need to do something about it. And thank God for the, the Wallaces. A man who is willing to what? To stand up. But listen to what happened to the man William Wallace. Because eventually he was turned over. Turned over, he was, you know, he was, he was turned over to the English. And he was dragged down to London. And it says this. He was killed using one of the most brutal punishments in the medieval era. He was hung, drawn and quartered. He was dragged naked behind a horse to a place of execution at Smithfield. Wallace was hanged, but will but will have been cut down while he was still alive. After this, his insides were removed and then they were burned. His head was dipped in tar and placed in a spike in London Bridge. His four limbs were sent to be displayed in Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling and Perth. That's what happened to the man that wanted to stand up. He would never receive a proper Christian burial, but before he was to go through the torturous death, listen, this is recorded, before he went through that torturous death, the scriptures that he carried with him were precious to him, were brought out, and he asked if it would be held in front of him, the word of God was read to him before he endured this horrific death because he was willing to stand up for freedom. His head was dipped in tar and was stuck onto the London Bridge. And that was like anybody that dares to mess about with us, that's what's going to happen to you. That's how the enemy works. Fear. Fear. And then we see that with our fathers. We see that with the man Patrick Hamilton. He was the first martyr, they say, of the Reformation. Our man Patrick Hamilton went over there as well to Europe and was, and was exposed to Luther, many other great men of God and then he came back to Scotland with a fire he came back with Scotland and says I need to challenge Catholicism popery the wickedness the evil that that institution represented then I'm not talking about now I'm talking about then they were wicked to the core and he came back with a passion to stand up against it our Patrick Hamilton glory to God and do you know what he got for that as well? Then he was lured to St. Andrews and he knew, he had it in his spirit, he knew that trouble awaited him, but he knew that God was calling to him. Now it's something none of us like to hear, isn't it, is the suffering element of being a Christian. We're so pampered. Well, bless me, bless me, bless me. The bigger the better. I, I just want to be cozy and comfortable. Listen, the very fact that you're a Christian, I want to tell you this, you're going to be attacked by these spiritual forces that I am talking about because they, they're going to hate you with a passion because now you're warring against them and their plan to take over this world and to destroy mankind. And he ended up being tried in St. Andrews and then he was taken out and he was burnt at the stake. Hallelujah. You can go to St. Andrews and you'll see his initials on the pavement as, as a memory to our Patrick Hamilton, a right godly young man. You know, he'd not been that long married and his wife was pregnant, and yet he was still willing to go. For the sake of Christ and the sake of the cause, he looked beyond himself. And God used it. It says, it says his burning flesh was, was smell across St. Andrews, and it caused an uproar within the people. 
caused people now to get very angry with Roman Catholicism. But that baton, if you like, passed on to George Wishart. And probably he was put to death in 1528 and George Wishart came along in 1544. We know Wishart was a, a traveling evangelist, a powerful man of God. We see God used this man mightily. Hallelujah, he rose up onto the scene. You see, the devil, the devil thinks he can kill one, but God will always raise up another. There's hope, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he thought, he thought he'd killed one. But out of that one, another arose. And George Wishart, for a couple of years, went round Scotland, and there was a young man with him, John Knox. And you know, Knox carried a sword. He was one of his bodyguards, and Knox was powerfully affected by this man, George Wishart. And then we know that George Wishart also was arrested and he also was burnt at the stake in St. Andrews for his witness to Jesus Christ. Actually, it's recorded that the man, the hangman, that was actually doing the business, it says that George Wisher had so much compassion because this man was just doing a job. Could you imagine that was your job? You know, the hangman? Your job was to brutally cut people's heads off and hang them and carry out all these atrocities, rip them open and spill their guts. Imagine that was your job. I mean, who the heck would want that job? How many people work in the abortion industry? How sad, isn't it? They think who could do such a job? And he says he hugged the man and he forgave him. The man must have been broken. He says, look, I'm, I'm only doing my job. And he, and he forgave him and he hugged him. And then he allowed himself to, well, we didn't have an option, did he? He was burnt at the stake. And then we see there came the great man, John Knox. Well, actually, they were all great. Then came the, out of that came a John Knox. The baton was passed. It was passed from Hamilton to Wishart to Knox. And then Knox was a man that was going to bring us to the conclusion. And he rose up with a fire within his bones. He challenged the kings and queens of the day, Mary of Guys, and then, of course, Mary, Queen of Scots. He challenged them. And it says they feared Knox more than all the Spanish Armada. In fact, it was all the armies of Europe. She says she feared the prayers of this man. I want to tell you this, this man, the power of God that was working within this man, I'll tell you this, you would, you would be trembling in your shoes. God powerfully used them. And that's when then we, we got to the, the great victory of 1560, when Scotland eventually became a free nation. Many other nations had been freed before that. Scotland was a wee bit later. There was a, there was a battle going on for Scotland between the French and we had the Protestant England at this time, and there was a Scotland was stuck in the middle of it, wasn't it? You know, and there was a, a battle that took place in 1560 between the forces, made of guys, and the French army, and the Scottish, the lords of the congregation, as they were called. That was a nobility within Scotland now who were very Protestant minded, and we were backed with the English. Thank God for the English who backed us. And that battle was won, and the French were booted back to France. Get out of here. That old alliance will have nothing of it. We are a nation, a proud Protestant nation, hallelujah. And the rest is history. Glory to God. But there's always going to be battles. And we see God is always going to be using these people. Let me just find my place here. I want to just read some things just of an inspiration and encouragement to you. I'm going to take this jacket off as I do so as well. Hallelujah. Just getting a bit hot in here. Or maybe it's just me getting a bit hot. You start talking about God, you can get a bit of fire in your bones, don't you? Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Sometimes you're out in the street there and you just want to grant, do you know what I'm saying? You just want to, just want to preach the word of God. Hallelujah, glory. But we've got many, many great men and women of God in this nation to be very, very proud for. Another one of them is Andrew Melville and um, another great man of God. And off the back of that 1560 with the Scots Confession of Faith, hallelujah. A declaration that says Scotland belongs to God. And Jesus only is king of this land. No other king. Christ Jesus is king of this land. That's why King Charles is the, maybe the, the, the head of the Church of England. He's not the head of the Church of Scotland. Hallelujah. Jesus and Jesus alone. That's, that's the thing that separated us as Scots. Christ and Christ alone. Jesus is king and lord of Scotland. Hallelujah. And we've got a national covenant with them, but we'll maybe push on towards that and some of the other brethren. I don't want to be stealing some thunder away from them and their notes and what we've seen. But this is what it says. It's in 1915, sorry, 1578, Andrew Mervyn Melville was the moderator of this Glasgow, the, the General Assembly, which accepted the second book of discipline. The book set out Presbyterian as the way that the church should be run. 
1581, the king's confession against Roman Catholicism was signed, probably reluctantly, by the king and the people across Scotland, not by the people. But in 1584, Melville had to leave the country after getting into trouble for a sermon he had preached. You know, how long for those days, aren't you? are going to get into trouble because of a sermon that you preached. For he refused to accept the government, to the authority of the government to make judgments on his preaching. For he said that he was a messenger of the king far above them. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, he then clanked his Hebrew Bible down on the table in front of them and he told them that it was for that which gave him his authority. Hallelujah. Amen. There was a man who knew where his authority came from. came from heaven. He wasn't going to be dictated to by our governments of the day, whether it be kings, popes, or whoever. With Melbourne gone, Parliament passed the Black Acts against Presbyterianism. But in 1596, and I love this one, Melville, sorry, Melville made a famous speech where he reminded the king again that there were two kings and two kingdoms in Scotland. As well as King James, there is Christ Jesus, the king of the church, whose subject James the VI is, and whose kingdom he is not a king. Not a lord, but not a head, but a member. Hallelujah. He put the king in his place. He says, Jesus Christ is Lord, sire. Yes, there's two kingdoms, and you're, you're king and lord of one. He says, but Jesus Christ, hallelujah, is lord of lords. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm just looking at the time. It's probably running away with this. Do you know, see, with kings and with people of importance, like Henry VIII, the kings wanted to be the new popes over the church, and that's the problem we ran into with Episcopi, the Episcopalian that's why he wanted his stuff and put upon us. They wanted to be Lord of the church. But there is only going to be one Lord of the church. Hallelujah. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I'm looking at the time, as we be coming close to the end of time, how are we doing for time, lads? Hallelujah. Somebody will remind me how we we're getting there. I don't want to interfere with people's lunches. We've we'll probably just ran over a little bit. So I'm going to save this for my second part. But listen, this is what I want to say to you. Brothers and sisters, we need to find out who we are again as the people of God in the land of Scotland. There is something unique about this land. There is something unique about Scotland. I know I've got it in my heart, I've got it in my soul, that this nation has got a special place in the, in the plans and the purposes of God. Because this nation made a covenant with the living God. We made a covenant with God. And I believe that God accepted this covenant. I won't put ourselves in Israel's covenant. But I want to tell you this, I believe we made a national covenant, and we'll probably visit that in my next little part that I'm going to be sharing. We made a national covenant with the living God. That was in 1638. Actually, in 1581, there was that covenant that we made. It actually was added to in 1638 in Greyfriars Kirkyard. I believe God accepted the covenant that Scotland made with them. Amen. God accepted that. I believe we're a covenant nation. Yes, we have failed. But you know something? God is faithful to his covenant. We may be faithless, but he is faithful. And he will not break, will not break that relationship with this nation. I believe, guys, I could get so excited just now. I believe that God has got plans for this nation. Yes, it seems dark. It seems as if it's the, the, the enemy has got the high ground. But I want to tell you this. There is one who inhabits the highest ground and he has got a plan for us as a nation, as a people. I want to encourage all of us today that we're here. I'm looking for God to birth something in each and every single one of us. That this could be a catalyst today for an uprising. And I'll save that for the second part. For an uprising again, of the church of God within the nation of Scotland, hallelujah, and this government and any other power and authority in the heavenlies and even on this earthly plane will know again that there is a church in the land of Scotland, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just looking at the time now, so amen.